Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And uh, we're just going to be in two verses today. Uh, there are two very important verses in the book of Romans. Uh, and we're going to talk about shameless gospel power today. That's our theme. Yes, I said shameless. Don't be scandalized, John. Uh, so, uh, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 today. And what we're going to be talking about is uh, these two verses. And your big idea is this, is that the central thesis, and I would say that Romans 1, 16 and 17 are the central thesis of Paul's entire letter to the Romans. So this is the crux. The central thesis of Paul's letter to the Romans is that we ought to live a life of unashamed belief in the gospel because of its great saving power. We ought to live a life of unashamed belief belief in the gospel because of its great saving power. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. We're going to take this just one verse at a time. And we'll, we've got two main points in verse 17 because there's a lot going on there. It's unlocked. No worries. So your, uh, your first main point, number one, a bold life for Christ relies upon the good news of Christ as its source of strength. A bold life for Christ relies upon the good news of Christ as its source for strength. How can I live as a Christian? That's a very simple question, very straightforward question. And there are probably a lot of ways that people would answer that question. But I think Paul in Romans 1, 16 and 17 answers for it for us in a very clear manner. And he says this, your life in Christ is based on that which saved you, which gave you life in Christ in the first place, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That without that and without continually looking back to that, you're not going to be able to live the life that God would have you to live. You're not going to be able to be the person that God would have you to be. That if you just say, I believe the gospel once, and you sort of leave that as a thing in your past, you are missing out. We are meant to kind of return to the gospel continuously, to feast upon the gospel regularly, to believe in the gospel daily, so that we might be gospel people every day. So that when I run into something that I don't know how to deal with, the first and foremost thing I can say is this, but I have a source of strength that enables me, whether or not I am triumphant in this difficult thing, to at least go through it and to come out the other side still held in the hand of Christ. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So let's start by picking through that. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's where we begin today. The believer in Christ is bold about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the baseline here. I'm not ashamed. When it, when when I am pegged as a Christian and someone says, oh, you're one of those. You believe in fairy tales. You believe in something that's, that's from some old dusty book. What is your response to that kind of inquiry? Do you kind of shrink? Do you kind of pull back? Do you say, I, yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I believe in that. Or do you say, yeah. I believe in that. And it's no fairy tale. It's real. It's the most historically verifi verifiable truth in the ancient world. 
is the resurrection of Jesus Christ upon which the gospel of Jesus Christ is based. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I don't apologize for it. I don't say, well, yes, sorry, I'm one of those. I don't do that. I am a Christian, and I'm not ashamed of it. We don't hide it if it seems somehow inconvenient. Well, that person, you know, they're one of those hypocrite Christians. Have you ever heard somebody say that? You're just a bunch of hypocrites. Have you met somebody who isn't a hypocrite? I'm sorry? Is that an exclusive to our domain? Yes. The problem is, is that we are often hypocrites. We will say one thing and mess it up. Yes, but there's a difference. I have a God who could save me from that. How about you? I'm sorry, are you not a hypocrite? Have you never said something and done the opposite? Uh, do you have a Savior? The, the, the thing about me being a Christian is not that I am perfect and squeaky clean and holier than thou. The, the reality of me being a Christian is this. I recognize that I'm a wretch. How about you? I know that I'm messed up. I know, therefore, I need a Savior. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? How am I not ashamed? For it is the power of God to salvation. Gospel boldness is warranted. Gospel boldness is warranted because the gospel is God's own power. It is a source of strength. Whenever, have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? And maybe it was like a coworker, or maybe it was a friend, or maybe it was a family member, or whatever. And kind of you've got this internal sweating thing going on where you're like, oh man, I hope this goes well. I hope that at least, you know, I don't come off like an idiot or whatever, right? Because I'm afraid that I'm going to mess it up, or I'm afraid they're going to reject me, or I'm afraid I'm going to look like an idiot, or whatever. Stop. Do you have any idea what you're handling when you handle the gospel? You are not here to save somebody. When you are in conversation with somebody about the gospel, you are not the one who converts them if they are converted to Christ. Do you know who is? God. Yes, it's Jesus. It's God himself. It is his power. So when you're handling the gospel, when you're sharing the gospel or sharing the good news with somebody, you can sit back and say, well, this is what the gospel is. I don't have to worry about it because guess what? The gospel itself does the heavy lifting. The power of God does not reside in my mouth. The power of God does not reside in my intelligence. The power of God relies and resides upon the very truth of what the gospel is. The good news of Jesus Christ. The announcement that Jesus Christ came, that he died for sinners, that he rose again on the third day, that he was seen by many witnesses, that he ascended to heaven, and that now he is drawing men and women and children to himself through this announcement that Jesus Christ is king. We are relying upon the heralded announcement of the kingship of Jesus Christ. And the power for all that is needed is in the gospel itself. When we speak the gospel, God himself is active in the truth of it. It isn't the person's own reasoning or force of will that converts them to Christ. It is the gospel itself that does that. God who does that. Because God raises the dead. When you are talking about a person who goes from non-believer to believer, what you're actually talking about is somebody who has just gone from dead in their trespasses and sins to alive in Christ. That's a miracle. It's resurrection. I was dead, now I am alive. The power of God 
does that. Not you, not your cleverness, not the other person's cleverness. Not them going, oh yeah, I got that figured out. I can, I can see that. That's, yeah, that's not their intelligence doing that. It's God awakening them and enlivening them to be able to receive it. It's nothing short of a miracle. We have a miracle working God, don't we? For I am not ashamed of the power, or I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believes. So we qualify it now. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So this, is, this phrase, is the, is, it has a couple of meanings that we're going to kind of pick apart here. The first one is, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It means every kind of person. Every kind of person who believes, every kind of person who responds in faith, that's the kind of person who is saved, who receives eternal life. And it's that, but it's also a shorthand for in the entirety of biblical history up to this point. So what Paul has just done is he said, this gospel is for everybody, but he's also said this is what has been operating from the first moment that somebody sinned and fell up to this day. To the Jew first, so he begins with Abraham. And he's going to return to Abraham in chapter 4. He's going, to, he's going to take what is here because Romans 1, 16 and 17 is the seedbed for the rest of the letter. And everything else that comes in the letter grows from the seedbed of 1, 16 and 17. He's going to rehearse the entirety of biblical history for us multiple times throughout Romans. And he's going to do it. He's going to give us these little snapshots. And he's going to do it again and again. But this is what he says. Look, the gospel is for every kind of person. And it has been for every kind of person since the first person sinned. To the Jew first, he begins by, by going after his own people, by, by creating for himself, rather, a people. And he does that through Abraham. And then he says to the people whom he draws out of the Exodus on Mount Sinai, in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, you shall be for me a special people, a peculiar people. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He says the entire nation, in effect, is a group of priests. Israel. Well, what does a priest do? A, a priest is one who brings the person, the other person, and God into the mix together. They're, they're, they're a mediating sort of role. And so the role of Israel was to help the entire rest of the world meet with God. And it didn't work out so well. But what we see as we go throughout the rest of the Bible is that that was actually part of the design because then Christ comes and he fulfills that role. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ fulfilled the role of Israel in himself to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. And that is the movement of the New Testament. It's finishing up that bit of the, the good news being uh, introduced to the Jewish world and then moving out to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world. And it, it grows and expands and it travels outward from Jerusalem. And so this is what's going on in Romans 1.16. It's we are bold gospel people because we are relying upon something that has been true since eternity past and has been operant in all of human history, that God saves sinners. Because we can't save ourselves. Because the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So this is what's going on. This is just the first verse. Second verse, we'll get there in a second. But so, uh, main point number two, the gospel puts the righteousness of God on full display. The gospel puts the righteousness of God on full display. And we're beginning in that to understand what Paul means by, for it is the power of of God. Well, how is it the power of God? In what sense is it the power of God? What does that power look like in actual practice? 
And that is going to be answered for us in 117. So Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And we're going to do this, this verse twice. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. All right. So, for. So that's a when you when you come across the word for, that's connective to what has come before. So if you're uh, paying attention, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also the Greek for. Consequence of all of that. In it, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. So let's stop there because he, he's got a verb that he attaches to it that we'll get to in a second. But let's focus on that noun idea of the very righteousness of God. Now, there are the basic meaning of righteousness. The basic meaning of righteousness is rightness according to God's standard. Rightness according to God's standard. So the gospel has to do with rightness as God defines it in some way. What the gospel accomplishes is that it takes people who are not right before God, who in their nature, as we've already said, are dead in their trespasses and sins, which means they are against the way of God. It takes that collection of people who have faith, and we'll get to that in a little bit here, and it makes them right in the eyes of God. It gives, and it doesn't just, and it's not just a perception thing. It actually creates actual righteousness, actual right standing within a person. It's not just a show. It's real down to your soul. Down to your bones, as somebody might say. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about righteousness, is this right standing, this idea of rightness according to the standard of God. Now, there are two senses of righteousness that ought to be understood here. The very first is this. It's God's own righteousness, that he within himself is righteous. He is completely consistent in his nature and character, and that he always comes through according to what he says. He always fulfills his promises. God is trustworthy. So that's the very first sense. When we talk about the righteousness of God, we're, we're first talking about his own intrinsic righteousness, that which is righteous according to his very character and nature. God is a righteous God. He's somebody who when he says, he does according to what he says. He is trustworthy in that regard. So it's God's own intrinsic righteousness that is of his nature. He is the standard of righteousness. There's no standard outside of himself. It's not that God is righteous because there is some floaty standard out there that's higher than him. He is the highest. Right? Because that is his character and his nature. So that's the first sense. The second sense is the righteousness he supplies then out of that to the account of his people. So it's God's own righteousness. And then from that, the righteousness, the right standingness that he gives to those who receive him, who receive Christ. So that's what we're talking about. Those two ideas are central. So this is what um, Martin Luther, in 1517, or thereabouts, as he is studying to prepare teaching a course on the book of Romans to his students at the monastery, he comes across Romans 1, 16 and 17. And Martin Luther had this problem. This huge problem. And this problem was he understood righteousness exclusively in that first category. 
that it was God's own intrinsic righteousness, that he was completely righteous and completely holy, and that it was a standard to which everybody had to live up to. The problem was is that he recognized he couldn't. And it tormented Martin Luther. And, and, and I say that word tormented not lightly because he got to a point, and this is from his own mouth, that he said secretly he hated God on account of this because he knew he couldn't live up to that standard of righteousness. He knew there was no way. And so he had this distance, this despising of God that he basically said, I, I can't, nobody can do this. And then he read Romans 1, 17 and saw and the doors of heaven opened to him in his mind, and he understood that it's not just that he has to somehow muster up the power and strength within himself to live up to God's standard of righteousness because he knew he couldn't, but that this righteousness was going to in some way come to him according to this passage. And the way he described it was it was a righteousness that was extra nos in Latin. It was foreign. It was alien to him. It came from outside of him and was credited to him. And as he read through Romans the rest of the way, it became clear how that happens and how that works. So these are the two senses of righteousness. So, uh, so uh, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now we come to that verb is revealed. God has put this righteousness on full display. Now, God had been putting his own righteousness in many ways on display, and you can read all about that in the Old Testament. He was showing his, his righteousness at various points. He would promise something and he would come through on that promise. But it was the second part that wasn't precisely clear until Jesus shows up. It was the second part, the part about us being made righteous. Now, that second part was happening. We just didn't see it. It just wasn't clear to the minds and the hearts and the lives of people. But God has put his righteousness on display fully and truly and clearly in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And now in his act of saving people through the gospel, crediting Christ's righteousness to your account. Because that's the only way you can have righteous standing before God. You have to be made righteous. Think of it like a bank account. If you open up your bank account and you have all of these bills that you have to pay and you see that you have not even, you know, 30 bucks or whatever, you have a deficit in your account. You owe. But you still got all of these bills that you have to pay. What are you going to do? How are you going to, how are you going to do that? You have no money. You have no prospect of getting more money. All you have is deficit, but those, bas those, those bills got to get paid. How? How does it happen? Well, in this, in, the, in the, 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 the bank account of righteousness, right standing before God, what Jesus does is he goes to the cross. He takes the sin, the burden, the wickedness, the, the, the destruction, the hellishness, all of this stuff that sets us apart from the path that God had for us. All that stuff that makes us unrighteous. He takes that upon himself at the cross. He crucifies it there with himself. He kills it. That's what Paul says in Colossians. He took that and he nailed it to the cross. He canceled the record of written debt that stood against us. So he cancels the debt, but he actually does a little bit more than just saying, all right, you're at zero. He then puts his own righteousness into your account, an inexhaustible store of righteousness. It's, it's enough to go around for whoever he wants to credit it to. 
And so what you have working on your behalf is not your own good works, is not your own ability, is not your own smarts, not your own good looks, not your own whatever you have that you think you have going for you. It is the very righteousness of Christ credited to your account. And there's nothing there that you've contributed. There's nothing there that you have contributed. It is all of Christ. It is all of Christ. Number three, we will only receive salvation and God's power to live if we entrust ourselves wholly to Christ. And this is where the how does that work comes in. How does that work? Romans 1, 17 again. So we'll read that. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And that's where we stopped in the last point. From faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. So, from faith... For faith, the revelation of this righteousness begins with God's own righteousness. God's own faithfulness is another word. It's a cognate word of what we're talking about when we talk about righteousness. So the idea here is this. God is faithful to his word from faith. When it says from faith, that's the faith that's in view there. God's faithfulness. From God's faithfulness to faith. So from faith to faith. So uh, the revelation of this righteousness begins with God's own faithfulness in fulfilling his promises. The Holy Spirit awakens us from death to life by revealing this faithfulness. So it's not, I looked at it with my smarts and figured it out. I was dead and dead men don't figure stuff out. Right? Right? Dead men don't do living things. So the Holy Spirit makes me alive. He regenerates. He opens up that understanding. Shows me the righteousness of God. How God faithfully did what he said he was going to do. And then my regenerated heart can look at that and respond in faith. Regeneration precedes faith. The Holy Spirit awakens us from death to life by revealing this faithfulness. His faithfulness then causes and creates a trust response that I couldn't do until I was shown His faithfulness. I couldn't have faith until I saw faithfulness. I couldn't have faith until I saw what He did is trustworthy. Faith in Him. So from faith, that is God's faithfulness, to faith, that is the creation of faithfulness or faith in us. From faith to faith. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We who have received Christ's righteous standing by faith, therefore live lives of trust in God. This is who we are now. Because he has done the heavy lifting, right? Because he has done the work, because he has done the going to the cross bit, the resurrection bit, the being faithful to all that he said bit. He has shown it to us, awakened us with his Holy Spirit, enabled us to respond in faith because we couldn't unless he had intervened and done something. Like I said, your conversion is a miracle. We now then respond in faith and live daily in faith. This is why I said in the beginning, this is not just about one thing that happened at one point in the past and I kind of set it on a shelf and forget about it. I daily return to this truth because this is how I live. In faith in Christ. That Christ will carry me as far as he needs to carry me. Now, the quote here that is at the end of Romans 1.17, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, is from the Old Testament. It's from Habakkuk. 
Love that name. Habakkuk chapter 2. And we're going to go to Habakkuk here. Because I think when we run across an Old Testament quotation, it's good to understand it in context. Now, the prophet Habakkuk was a bit of a complainer. (laughs) So the whole book, it's just like three chapters long or whatever. The whole book is a a series of complaints that he has and God's responses to those complaints. That's that's how it's framed. It starts with him complaining and God responding. And him complaining then about God's response and then God responding and then Habakkuk wises up and is thankful to God in the end. Okay? There's your summation of Habakkuk. Right? But so, God has responded to Habakkuk. So the first complaint that Habakkuk has is this. Look, God, your people are messed up. We're not acting like the people of God. We are not faithfully following the law that you gave us, and we're running around doing all of this crud that we shouldn't be doing, and it's messing us up. How can you allow this? God, do something about this. So God responds. He says, I am going to do something about it. I've been planning to do something about it, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up a nation called Babylon. I'm going to send Babylon to come and destroy you. That will be my response to your unrighteousness. And Habakkuk goes, wait a minute. How can you do that? Yes, we're unrighteous, but now you're using these far more unrighteous people to come and destroy us. How can you do that? How can you do that? And then the response that God gives is, I'll deal with them. You don't worry about that. I've got them. Their their time is numbered too. Their days are numbered as well. And so Habakkuk is like, "Uh, what are we going to do? And he has this moment of revelation and realization. This is how he responds. So after that first complaint and then the Lord's answer and his second complaint... This is what happens. So he, this is the end of his second complaint. Verse 1. I will, ta- I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So that's how he ends his second complaint. All right, now I'm going to watch and see what happens. What, what's God going to do now? And this, the beginning part here, verses 2 through 4, is God's partial response to Habakkuk. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So God has a response for Habakkuk. He says, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. Now, background here. This is exactly the the whole sending Babylon and having Babylon take Israelites captive and destroying the nation and all that sort of stuff for a period of time. That is exactly what God said he was going to do. He promised he would do that back in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is this. So Deuteronomy is the last book of the law. It's the last of the first five books of the Bible, right? And the the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch or the Torah, the law of God. And the, the kind of the end of that whole book, we find it around Deuteronomy chapter 28. And Deuteronomy chapter 28 is this. The first part of it is, if you follow me, if you obey my commands, if you obey my statutes, I'm going to bless you. And it will be unlike anything this world has ever seen. I'm going to bless you this way. I'm going to bless you that way. I'm going to bless you this way. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you in the field. I'm going to bless you in your corner. I'm going to bless you in your kids. I'm going to bless you this way and that way in all ways that you can possibly imagine. And it's going to be great. And it's a decent list of blessings that God promises to his people. But then there's a caveat. He says, but if you do not obey my commands, if you refuse my statutes, I will not bless you. I will curse you. 
I will curse you in your field. I will curse you in your corn. I will curse you in your kids. And all of the ways that he promised to bless them, he says he will curse them. And then the list keeps going. And part of that list is, I will send you away from me. I will send you into exile. Habakkuk, God's response to Habakkuk of I'm sending the Babylonians is completely in line with what he said in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. That is the faithfulness of God. And, and you know what's fascinating is that we have this, you know, Israel goes into exile. They're in exile for approximately 70-ish years. They return to the land. They're in the land for a while. And then it's, it's radio silence from God for about 400 years. So what some scholars refer to as the time of God's silence. He seems to not be talking with Israel. But then he starts talking with Israel again. And the first thing he says is to this young girl, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. It says through an angel that he announces to Mary. And what do we know about Jesus? Jesus lives. He's God in human flesh. He lives a perfect life and completely without sin. And he goes to the cross for our sins. He's crucified. He's buried. On the third day, he's raised again, according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by many witnesses. That's the gospel. The answer to your struggle and mine is, do I trust this God? Do I trust this God? The context of Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, is rampant unfaithfulness of God's people, God raising up Babylon to chastise them, and the promise to faithfully deliver his people from evil. And he does that in Christ, which is why the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God. It's him showing exactly how he was going to do what he said he was going to do. This is why it is the power of God, because it, it's him doing, it's him acting, and nobody can seem to stop him. They're trying to stop God by crucifying Christ, and in the process, end up accomplishing the very thing that God said he was going to do. This is why Paul in Colossians says, in the cross, he triumphed over the powers because he showed them who was truly powerful. He is. This is why in Psalm 2, the nations rage and the Lord looks at them and laughs. The Lord in heaven laughs at them because they're so cute with running around with their little power. Oh, look at what they're trying to do. Oh, look at Russia. Look what, it's, well, look what it thinks it can do. Let me show you what power is, and he sends his son Christ to the cross to save people. Now, there's, a, um, there's an old Rich Mullins song. I don't know if you know who Rich Mullins is. He was one of my favorite contemporary Christian music singer when I was growing up. He died in a car accident in 1997. He has a song called While the Nation Rage. And it's based mostly on Psalm 2. But there's a line in there that says, the bullets can't stop the prayers we pray in the name of the Prince of Peace. And the idea that's sitting behind that is that God is more powerful than all of their ways that they flex, and all of the ways that they think they're the most powerful. Well, I've got so much land. I've got all of this oil. I've got all of this ability. I've got this army that's this size. You got nothing because you don't have Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
We are called to live faith response to God every day. Even the very faith that we express to God is itself a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. What's the gift of God? The salvation? Yes. But the faith too. The way that that sentence is constructed, it's to point us to the fact that the faith that we place in God is a gift to us from God. You didn't even generate the faith. You had to be given to that given that by God. Mark chapter 9. We'll close with this. Mark chapter 9. Verses 14 through 27. This is a father who's at his wits end. And he brings his demon-possessed son to Jesus because he just can't take it anymore. And he says, you know, we've had this problem since he was born. Since he was real little. And I can't take it. And I, I, this needs to be taken care of. So, verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And when it, whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and he grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has, he been, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. This is somebody who, when he meets Jesus, and he has this problem, his son is demon-possessed, and this is something that's serious, it's endangering this kid's life, and he's at his wit's end, and he comes to Jesus, and he's like, I can't do anything. Your disciples couldn't do anything. Can you please help the boy? And, and he says, if you can. Like, he does, he, he's, he's at a point now where he's like, you know what? This is a formality. Nothing's getting done. And Jesus looks at the guy and he says, he, he quotes himself back to him. He says, if you can. Like, he's incredulous. Of course I can. But you have to believe. You have to trust me. And he says, I do believe. And then he backtracks. And he says, help my unbelief. Father says, yeah, I believe. Oh, you know what? I don't believe. Help me. Help. Give me faith. Give me faith. There's a great meme that I saw that said, are you telling me I need Je Jesus to go to heaven? Brother, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. We do. We do. We need Jesus to give us faith. 
We need Jesus to give us the faith that we don't have. We need to turn to Jesus and cry out to him, help my unbelief. Sometimes you feel like you need a miracle. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Sometimes you feel like this isn't going anywhere. Help my unbelief. Sometimes you feel like this is over. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. For I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from his faith to the creation of faith in me. For as it is written, the just, the righteous, those who have been made righteous, we will live by faith. Help my unbelief. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of the gospel of Christ, the gift of the powder keg of power that it is, that it is not about us being smart enough to figure it out, being smart enough to convince somebody else of it, but that it is the thing that does the work of conversion in a soul. We pray, Father, that as we live daily from this point, we will be reminded of our desperate need for you and be reminded every step of the way that you always fulfill your promise. You will complete the good work that you started in us on the day of Christ Jesus. You will carry it to completion. However long that means, whatever it means we have to go through, let us have faith in you, Father. Help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.